Today we have David Rose with us. David Rose is a managing partner of Vincent's um, accounting firm. I know David for quite some time and we were talking about this interview and why it's important for actually people to see view of a great accounting um, operator about one economy about people and money spending three how to actually get advice from accountant and why it's important to have advice from accountant when you're starting your own business so we have david um with us here today that we're going to have a casual chat about everything that i just said so welcome david thanks Amir. so there's a lot of happening in today's economy one we got elections coming up and there's a lot of bad things in the air, a lot of people are nervous, what's going to happen, who's going to win, um, how are we all going to be affected, and obviously how will property market be affected. Before we start talking about everything, who do you think is going to win? Oh. <laughs> I'm not uh, going to ask you who you're going to vote for, but who do you think is going to win? I think the um, I think the cards are stacked for a Labor a Labor win, everything that I'm seeing. I mean, if you look at sports bet, you know, yes. that Labor are definitely um, favourites. Um, to win there and I think if you watch um, if you've been watching what's happening globally uh, I think that people uh, would like change and and not necessarily um, not necessarily go with um, who may be um, you know best for the job but just go you know it's time for a change and we're sick of um, you know we're sick of things you know not changing so I'm expecting um, a Labor win. And if Labor does win big question we'll ask ourselves how will that actually affect the, the national business market in general? And the second question is, how will that actually affect property market? Okay, well, I think the um, I think business market in general. I mean, we're probably already seen, um, and as you typically do um, prior to an election, um, things starting to you know quieten down a bit around the business community. I know that um, you know I've travelled to uh, Melbourne and Canberra, uh, Melbourne and Canberra this week, and um, you know, being around on the weekend last weekend, that it's a lot quieter in the you know the restaurants and bars. Um, you know, people aren't doing much from a, a, a transactional perspective. Um, but I think if people understand um, some of the policies that are about to change, I would have expected to see, and certainly in the property market, a uh, different level of activity. Um, you know, around uh, property investment um, to get in uh, before changes are made. So, for average person that is watching this interview, what's the difference for people to buy property today and after election if Labor wins? So, um, so if Labor wins, I mean, there's been a lot of you know uh, conversation, you know, around um, around imputation credits and superannuation funds, but there's two fundamental changes that are coming uh, for a Labor government win around property. So, if you buy a property today um, as an investor then you will receive, if you dispose of that property, a 50% discount on the gain that's subject to tax. It's a lot of money. It can be a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So under a Labor government, um, that 50% discount has been reduced to 25% discount. Okay. And it's, um, it's not retrospective legislation. Um, it, it will be after the election day, so we're expecting an election sometime in May. So uh, the expectation is that the rules will change after the election date, or possibly at the beginning of the next financial year, being one July. I know you can't really give um, advice to to people here, but uh, your kind of suggestion is that um, it is almost a lot better to buy properties today than it would be after Labour wins, if Labour wins. Yeah, I think that I mean, you know, whilst I, you know, whilst I don't give advice and everyone's situation is different, um, I always, um, you know, always respond based on what I would do, right? So what if, would it, you do? if it were me and I was considering at all investing in property, um, then it would be something that I would make sure that I transacted on prior, um, prior to the election. Now, us obviously at NG Real Estate, we see a lot of investors that are buying properties 
um, or we see a lot of mom and dads that are buying homes to live in and it's very surprising to us how many people are actually not educated about taxes that they're gonna have to pay uh, or accounting in general so one question that I have for you is how important is for anybody that is willing to buy investment property to actually see accountant before they do it yeah I think it's uh, I think it's important um, and the biggest the biggest thing that I see people overlook when it comes to owning property um, and it's not even it's not so much income tax it's actually land tax and the way that they structure an ownership of a property um, that could be subject to land tax um, past a certain dollar value and you know I see a lot of situations where people are complaining about paying land tax but if they were structured in a particular manner that um, that might be something that um, is spread um, for them rather than copying it if they owned it as individuals. So I think that the way I see it as well is real estate agents obviously most of them they just really want deal to go ahead um, uh, but I also think it is important probably for real estate agents to be talking to accounting firms and almost every time they're about to sell investment properties they should be uh, not advising but in a way they should be suggesting for any buyer to see actually accountant to see how they should be structured before they actually yeah, I think putting that, um, the name on the contract. Yeah, abso absolutely. And I think that the you know that education piece is is something that's not only lacking uh, in relation to um, you know people buying investment properties or buying property. It's the education piece around you know people borrowing money, um, you know as well, and what you know what all of that all, that all means. And there's a there's a lack of education, and people whinge about rule changes and everything like that that's gonna happen, it's life. Right? The education around it is something that the smart people will get an understanding of, and once they've got their understanding, make their decisions more informed than most others. Talk of education, um, in Australia, and pretty much I'm sure in every other country in the world, we all have to pay taxes. We cannot run away from it, otherwise we're going to be punished. So we all have to pay taxes. And everything we buy includes taxes, includes GST. But one thing that, that we are all lacking is education. And I think it starts from even high school as well, that kids these days are not being educated, even in high school, what is ahead What's waiting for them once they finish their school? Could be high school or university. So how important is for them to be getting that advice when they are really at that young age? And how important is actually for for universities and and um, high schools to really educating people? Yeah, I think that um, I think that I think that it's lacking. I think that it's lacking in both um, both high schools and um, you know in colleges and universities. I think. Financial literacy and understanding is probably one of the biggest gifts that you could give a child outside of personal development. 100%. And so you would suggest for anybody really, even if they're not educated through high school or university, that before they really start, um, uh, start their life in, in, in work environment, that they should really have a good conversation with accountants for, for, for him or her to tell them, look, this is what's waiting for you for next 30, 40 years, and this is really something you need to be educated about. Yeah, absolutely, and I, you know, like it's 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 quite funny. My my youngest um, daughter is 16 years old. Um, she's got herself um, a part-time job, and she came to um, to Don and I, my wife, uh, last week, and 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 you know, possibly because you know we've both got accounting backgrounds, but she wanted to um, prepare a budget. So we sat down with her um, and prepared a budget, and it was hilarious. Like you know, what kids spend their money on? <laughs> Total crap. Um, but you know what they spend their money on, and just having that understanding, and and for her to see it, and she goes, "Oh my god, I waste so much, you know, like I waste so much money, yes. uh, you know, like on things." So um, it is really, and it's not, it's not a particularly difficult exercise 
um, to go through and it's not a time consuming exercise just to get some real fundamentals around financial literacy so that you've got an understanding of you know that sort of you know that sort of thing I mean you know years and years ago I remember you know Commonwealth Bank used to have the Donald Duck bank account things used to have this little uh, this little book that you know you're at school and you'd go and put your 50 cents yes. you know into the Donald Duck thing that got people to save money Yes. Right? Uh, in terms of it. And there's still people today, and it was I reckon it was a brilliant marketing exercise by Commonwealth Bank at the time in order to start a banking relationship with someone at such a you know, a young age. Um, but it's just, you know, again it's just that 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 lack of education. Um, you know, I think if people were better educated Emil that there would be um, you know, less challenges from bankruptcies and insolvencies and um, you know, people structuring themselves the right way for, to protect their assets. Um, and, you know, accountants don't do themselves any favours. Um, you know, I've told you before about the story about, you know, trusted advisor and fraud and, you know, the fraud thing that um, I uncovered for one of my clients. But um, it's, um, it's that simple education piece or that investment in that education that will save people a lot of money downstream. What advice would you have for anybody that is willing to start business tomorrow? I think there's two things. I think that they need to really understand how to properly structure themselves and the structuring component doesn't only have to deal with saving income tax. That's a byproduct in my eyes. Right? The structuring first and foremost should set up something from an asset protection perspective so that it doesn't expose those people downstream as their business becomes successful or if they take um, larger risk in relation to um, other activities. And the second thing that I think that people really have to have a, a good understanding of is cash flow and cash forecast. And uh, as accountants, we're great historians, you know, we'll prepare someone's tax return, um, you know, at the end of the year, but it's that sitting down and forecasting with them so people have a very clear understanding of what's ahead that will make a difference. The, the sad part is, um, I'm not exactly sure what the percentage is, but there's a huge percentage of businesses that do fail within the first two or three years. And um, uh, do you think a lot of them do fail for the lack of great structure or education when it comes to budgets and managing money? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think both. Um, and I think coupled with the fact that, you know, with, with those in mind that people don't understand um, that just because they've got a certain, you know, amount of money in the bank account that that's theirs to spend. So it's not, you know, saving for the income tax or understanding, but, you know, the GST, um, you know, liability. So, um, you know, they'll go out and go, oh, I've got $150,000 sitting in my bank account, I'll go and buy a new car. Or I'll go on that holiday when, you know, 90 days, you know, downstream, that money's needed to, um, you know, to pay taxes. So, uh, you know, as I said, it's not, I don't think it's a particularly difficult exercise. And yes, it's easy for me to say that as an accountant, but I think there's some fundamental, there's just some underlying fundamentals that if people, that people got right, you wouldn't see the failures. And my understanding is it's two in, two in five businesses fail in that first, um, that first period of time. Which is really sad because a lot of them, once they do fail, they're scared to get up and keep going again. So they actually leave the business world and then they might end up becoming working for somebody else. But this country is built on small businesses specifically. Absolutely. How important are small businesses for this economy? I think that, um, I think that more and more you, you will see, and I call it an emerging economy because I think we're seeing a significant shift in the way that business has been done. Um, historically, if you go into um, shopping malls um, and centres, you know, in five years' time, you're going to see smaller shops, right? And you're going to see trends towards, you know, obviously, um, you know, I go into my reception area at Vincent's, um, you know, of a morning, the, the mail arrives, and there's all these parcels that have arrived, people have bought stuff online. Um, you know, that, that change, um, you know, is... Um, pushing people to be doing stuff for themselves. You know, you live in a world of social media. Um, you know, people making money out of being Instagram influencers. 
um, they're running their own business. Businesses that didn't exist 10 years ago. Now, there's people that are there's people that are lawyers and teachers um, who used you know used to be in those professions that are going and opening, you know, their own their own businesses and giving things you know giving things a crack. I, and I think it's fantastic, um, you know, that people are doing it. So I believe that it will be a lot of those businesses that drive you know the economy. It's those businesses that are successful will spend the money. Um, you know, in the cafes and and the shops and and support um, you know support those sorts of things. But you know, Australians, you know, are kidding themselves if um, you know if they think that um, young people and people who are starting businesses aren't smart enough to know where to get things cheap or what to do. I mean, you only have to walk into a retail shop and see people snapping photos of you know, like particular items to compare prices. Now, um, years ago, one, you couldn't do it. And two, um, you know, the concept of, you know, impulse buying, um, you know, is what shopping centres and shops relied on. You know, the young people are way more educated these days. They know where to get a deal. They know where to get a, a coupon code um, for something. So it's like, if you build it, you got to work your ass off to promote it yes. in order for people to come and understand what people are looking for. You have been in accounting world for 31 years. I have. 31 I don't know, years. I don't have that whole thing. <laughs> you don't. <laughs> so let's just say that you started working as accountant when you were nine years old. That, that, that um, complements your age. But in 31 years of your, um, really, your experience, you have seen a massive shift in technology. I mean, in a whole conversation that we just had with technology, how dangerous is or businesses not to be moving ahead with times? Because a lot of businesses are affected. I mean, look, if you go to McDonald's these days, you don't even have to speak to anybody there. There's actually a, a computer screen that you can literally order your meal there without actually speaking to somebody. What's really interesting when you go to McDonald's, all the people that are my age or your age, we still go and talk to somebody that is at, at, um, in front of us if you wanna order a meal. But anybody really that is 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, they're not doing it. They're actually on the computer, on the screen, and ordering whatever they want. I mean, even McDonald's, I have read a, a news article yesterday, they spent $400 million on a, uh, they purchased basically a technology company that's going to revolutionize the way they do things. How important is that technology and how important it is for businesses to really be aware of what's happening in front of them? Um, you know, Netflix blockbuster, right? Yeah, a great example. example of it. Um, I remember um, when Uber presented itself into the market and in Australia, you know, the taxi industry was up in the arms if the taxi industry spent the money that they spent on fighting Uber, which was inevitable in my opinion, if they spent that money on changing their technology in order to compete, they'd be very competitive right now. They didn't do it. I see examples where, um, you, know, you know, close to home for me, accounting firms who never don't move with the times with the cloud-based technology or um, you know getting their clients you know to shift and move on uh, to those sorts of things you know whilst people you know hate GSD the introduction of GST into this country really forced people to move into technology to enable themselves to properly report um, you know their GST um, you know to the government you know unfortunately you know, and people may not be aware, but I can see a point in the not too distant future where the software that you're using will be directly linked to the tax office in order to report your tax obligations. And you're not gonna rely on people like me or need people like me uh, in terms of that. That's a good and a bad thing, but the technology that underlies the platforms that you use are things that will help you grow your business, understand your business, have a better, picture of your business than you ever have before. Do you think technology is good or bad for us? I love it. I'm an absolute advocator for technology and change with technology. Now this is a little bit private question, it's, it's um, not regarding um, business I guess, 
How dangerous is technology for kids and their family time? Because a lot of, I, I remember when I was a young kid, um, obviously there was no iPads and, and um, I used to play soccer with my friends every single day for a couple of hours after school. And these days, a lot of um, uh, kids are glued to iPads at home. Do you think that's good or bad for kids? I think it's terrible. I, I, and, it, and it's a challenge. I've got three daughters, um, 21, 18 and 16. So they've grown up in what, you know, in the technology. In Not the like technology the age times. like two of us when we used to just chase people around. And I used to ride a, ride, a, ride a push bike, you know, like um, miles to get to school, never catch it, never caught a taxi. So, yes. you know, it's all too easy to jump on your phone and get an Uber. Yes. Um, it's all too easy to jump on your phone. It's it such a home in three minutes. Yeah, and, and, and order Uber Eats without your mum and dad even knowing. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, those right. sorts of things. So uh, it presents itself as, an, as a massive, massive problem um, for us. And I don't know if you've ever seen um, um, talks by a, a gentleman by, called Simon Sinek. Yes. Right? He sums it up very well about the problem associated um, you know, with technology and and what we're doing to our, you know, what we're doing um, to our kids and that world of self entitlement and and um, anxiety and depression and bullying and all those sorts of things um, that come from the fact that you're so connected to a yes. community um, of people and not your parents not knowing yes. what's going on. But so it is very important for parents to actually spend even more time with their kids and educate them that there's a lot more um, in life besides the mobile phone that you have in your hand or iPad. And it used so to be, uh, you know, it used to be uh, when, when our kids were first born, before the technology was thing, it used to be that, you know, you put them, um, you know, the wiggles, yes, you know, yes. used to keep them, you know, like occupied now, like now it's, it's a lot more, um, you know, I, I personally believe, and you know, it has nothing to do with accounting, but you know, I personally believe that there's a lot of um, misdiagnosis of um, kids with ADD, ADHD, um, you know, by you know the medical community, you know, teachers in general. When what it comes down to in some cases is a lack of understanding of how children learn. Yes. Right? A lot of people that are diagnosed with ADD and ADHD, they're actual visual learners, right? And that's the way to get through and help them to understand. But, you know, because they're disruptive in class and everything like that, because of, you know, the way that things are taught, um, you know, auditorily, mm. um, you know, that we're missing, uh, we're missing an opportunity to, um, you know, to have our kids learn the right way um, and not be medicated. It's and really I also sad. think I also think that education, that we education system in general, we have to ask ourselves, because technology is moving so fast, is education education system actually catching up to the times that we are living in today? Do you think it is? Yeah, absolutely not. I I I'm very critical of the universities in particular because we get, um, you know, we um, have a graduate application program. And you know the universities come and they talk to me, and they say, Rosie, you know what? Why why aren't people employing our graduates? Right? And I say to them, and this was a recent discussion in the last twelve months um, with one of the universities here in Brisbane. Um, you you're not relevant in terms of what you're teaching, and they're a little bit offended and they wanted to understand more. And I said to them, um, this particular university, I said, are the first five subjects that you teach in your accounting degree? And I rattled off the five subjects that I did when I first started. And they said, yeah, how did you know that? And I said, because I did that 30 years ago, and those still, subjects. Still there. And they're still there today. Um, I can see um, a significant shift in who accounting firms employ into the future because people are doing actuary degrees for data analytics. Data analytics is a, is a way of the future. Data is an extremely powerful thing. The accounting fraternity, 
hasn't cottoned onto it. The universities want to have their own courses around it, but they haven't, you know, they haven't done those things yet. And in the meantime, you've got all these young people that are driving um, significant changes in occupations for the future. You know, you quite often hear people say, in a teaching sense, we are teaching people for jobs that don't exist right now. Budgets, we all lack education when it comes to budgeting our money. How do you simplify it for all of us? All of us that are not accountants, for you comes naturally because you are in the, in the world of accounting, you are in the world of managing money. But all of us that are watching this, we think to ourselves, oh my God, we earn $50,000 a year or $100,000 a year or $200,000 a year. But what people don't understand, okay, if you earn $100,000 a year straight away, you need to give a gift to government, they take portion out of it, then you have to give portion out of your mortgage, then portion out of this and portion out of that. And then by the time you pay everything, people get shocked. Oh my God, I got no money. How important it is to actually budget things? And how do we educate ourselves to actually budget? Um, you know, it's a, that's a subject near and dear to my heart. And I think that the, the way, I mean, I've invested together with my wife significantly in our children's education. I've got a daughter at Stanford. I have one that went to Geelong Grammar and another one that went to Girls Grammar. In one particular year, it's vomit material how much I paid for that education. I couldn't have done that without a very disciplined approach to budget. And that has nothing to do with me being an accountant. It's just the circumstances that I found myself in. Now, people may not realise because everyone's jumping up and down, um, you know, in a banking sense about, oh, the banks are doing this and the banks are doing that. And again, we talked about it before, that education piece actually needs to be around the fact that people need to understand that a bank is going to take three months of your entire spending history, credit cards, bank statements, and analyze it, and analyze it in a sense of whether you can actually service a loan. And I am seeing an increasing number of people whose loan applications are being declined simply because of that spending activity in that 90 day time frame. Um, yet, there is technology that exists. Your banking app categorizes your expenses you know, for you so that you do have an understanding you know, of what that means. You know, like, yep, it's because I'm accountant, but you know, of a Monday, a Monday night, you know, for me, it's not date night. For me, it's like, you know, what happened in the previous week's spending? Budget What's night. coming up? It's yeah. budget night in the Rose household, you know, on a Monday night. And I you know, sit down with my wife and, and we look at it. It's that discipline that's enabled us to do the things that we want to do, um, you know, for our future and, and my family's future. And I think it is important because a lot of people, a lot of stress that, that people have in their personal lives is because of finances, unfortunately. A lot of marriages have issues because of finances. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with, with people not, not being good with their money. And, um, and I see quite often many people earn huge amount of money, but when it comes to the savings, they almost have Absolutely. That, which is really sad. You're not exactly 30 years old, you're a little bit older than that. So you have Thank been you, in accounting for 31 years. You have been in a business world for quite a long time. What is one business advice you can give to anyone? Um, the best piece of advice that I can give to anyone in business we talked a lot about education. That uh, that in itself um, is, you know, is the thing that I think people fail to do. Um, I read a lot. Right? I don't have a lot of time to read, but I I read a lot. I subscribe to something called Summary.com, which takes management entrepreneur books and summarizes them in eight pages. Right? I don't have the time, but I will always make the time to read them, and they're audio books. Um, that and an investment in personal development. I think that that's underrated. Now, in any business, there are good business people and there are bad business people. Real estate agents, for example, they're great real estate agents and they are one that are terrible. Same goes for accountants. So a lot of young people that want to start their business or a lot of people that simply want to choose accounting because we all need accounting, we all need to have tax returns. So if I'm 20 years old or 25, 
And if I want to interview accountants, how do we know who's a good and who's a bad accountant? Because we are not accountants when we're starting our business, when we are 20 years old. And we go and, and any accountant we speak to, they think they're smart, they know what they're doing. How do we know who's the right person for us to pick? I think that uh, I think that's that's a that's a great question. Uh, I think it's a very difficult question uh, for me to answer because you know I'm so not an accountant. It's not funny, but uh, I think that if you're interviewing an accountant and their primary driver, um, you know, for you is saying that I'm going to save you this amount of money, you know, or I'm going to save you a heap of tax, you know, you need to ask the next question, you know how specifically are you going to do that? Because one of the biggest challenges, we've got a forensic accounting uh, business unit. One of the things that we see is this, um, you know, what I call shit advice that accountants give to their clients and get them into trouble because of that advice. Um, so you've got to ask yourself, and it's that old adage, if it sounds too good to be true, it is. It is. So, um, you know, they need to be able to have conversations with you um, about a whole range of things. Um, an accountant who can just talk accounting and tax, in my opinion, is someone to avoid. You know, accountant that can talk to you about, um, you know, genuine life experience, advising the way that they, um, you know, act themselves. Um, in, you know, someone that you'd want to, you know, that you'd want to do some work with. Um, and I think um, more and more so, um, you know, referrals from someone else. Like if you see that someone, um, you know, who's been able to do particular things in business, um, you know, um, are successful. I'm in business with someone at the moment um, who used to look after this client. We merged with this firm a number of years ago and this particular person was looking after this client of mine. And they give him an absolute bollocking of a time around the advice that you know he was giving them at the time. And the, the one significant change that I gave them um, and that they embraced, I said, don't be greedy. Yes. Right? Leave something on the table. This particular client's a hospitality client. They owned a cafe when I first met them. They owned 26 restaurants and bars. You know now, and you were part of their journey, and I've been part of the journey, and, and I'm so proud of them for you know what they've accomplished, because they embraced that philosophy and brought people into the business, key people into each of those businesses but also as you, owners. You, but also, you cared enough about your client to to go through the journey with them as well, which is important. Yeah, there's a, I mean that you know that's something that is. I mean, I think quite often will say to people, I care more about my clients than they care about themselves. Which is important. For any business owner, how important is balance, family time and business time? Because you have a beautiful wife and three daughters, and obviously being in business for some time, you face that every single day. You do have company, that you are running, and you also have a family that is at home. I think the key to it all is flexibility. That you know, there's always times where you need to absolutely commit to um, achieving an outcome. You know, from a business perspective, and you know, I think work-life balance is a choice. You know, I interviewed someone yesterday. Um, you know, around that, and I just said, you know, it, it's a choice that people make. Like I make a choice about work-life balance, but. I also make a choice about flexibility so that if something is going on um, and you know like I can I can drop things and go and take my daughter for a driving lesson yes. in the middle of the day right and I build that there's, flexibility there's around my day being, being on of the business I guess. yeah and I think that uh, I think that it needs to be it needs to be front of mind um, you know I've been through periods where I know I've worked way too hard and um, you know, but you had to to get to where you are today. I, I think you do, but I think if you use that as the, I think if you use that as the, the the base platform in everything you do, you'll never change the working too hard thing. Um, you've got to reward yourself for the hard work and effort. You've got to have that flexibility. You've got to know that at some point in times you've got to get off the roundabout, right, and take care of your health. 
um, and then because you know that's a, that's a primary thing. If you don't have your health, then you know the rest of it's a complete has been a complete um, you know waste of time. Do you have office in Brisbane? Yes, we do. And your specialty is not just in one field. What exactly do your, does your company specialize in? Um, so, so you often hear the concept of, of full service firms and Vincent's is a full service firm. We have offices at Brisbane, Gold Coast, um, Sydney, Canberra, Adelaide. And um, the, uh, the, the full service aspect of our of offering was we have forensic accounting, we have an audit business, we have a, um, a business advisory business, and we have um, an insolvency business. So they're really the keys that you see in a lot of accounting practices. But when I talk about full service, I talk about if you're wanting to borrow money, if you're wanting to invest money, um, if you're wanting access to a lawyer about estate planning or transactional stuff, we have that, um, we have that wrapped around our service offering um, for people. Um, and we do it, you know, we do a lot of it based on, um, you know, people's values, not based on what product's gonna make us um, the most amount of money. So when I talk about full service, I can walk in, um, you know, somewhere, um, you know, with with people and go, here's the person that's going to, you know, work with your tax. Here's the person that's going to help you out with the insurances. Here's the person that is going to get you your loan, right? And here's the person that you need to, you know, work with. In terms so you of can deal with somebody that is just starting their own business, or somebody that is earning sixty thousand dollars and they need advice, or businesses that have a turnover of hundred million. Absolutely, we've got time, and I and I, you know, drop off tax returns to ninety-year-old widows, right? Um, and I also work for companies um, in a um, a part-time CEO capacity for companies that are turning over 50, 60 million dollars. What's next for David Rose? I know you're never going to retire. I hope Donna is um, watching this. I think, <laughs> I think that um, I, you know, I think that for me, um, you know, I, I spend um, I spend um, a bit of time um, overseas and understanding um, things that are happening overseas. Um, you know, you talked about technology before. I think for me that it will be, um, you know, and and from a from a Vincent's perspective, there will be something significantly driving um, our business that has a technology bent to it um, that makes us a lot more efficient than even what we currently are. Thank you. And thanks Thank for your time. You. Thank you.